Welcome to my video for Leo 2019. It's the latest in my series, Boot Camp for Saints, where I walk through each part of the Gospel of Mark as it maps to the different signs of the Zodiac. At the same time I'm uploading this video, or sometime very soon after, I'm uploading two others, two and a half others actually. One will have a section split off and uploaded separately because it involves a new line of research that I'm working on. The one and a half videos are called The Expert Consensus is Typically Wrong. The other half video is The Documentary Hypothesis is Certainly Wrong. The other full video is Sometimes It Actually Is Adam and Steve, as opposed to Adam and Eve. That's going to be uploaded later because the t-shirt that comes with it is light, and I like having themed t-shirts to go with my videos. I like to think that it shows I'm not phoning it in. In the first video, I'm showing how my own work has successfully subverted the expert, expert consensus in three different areas. And the third example of that is the documentary hypothesis, which scholars use to show how the Pentateuch was put together. That's the first five books of the Bible, supposedly written by Moses. We thought it was for millennia, and I believe that it still was. It's missing a major point. That research led me to chapter 33 and 34 of Exodus, which points right back to our Leo section. I don't think that's a coincidence. I'm pretty sure that's the Holy Spirit, and he hasn't stopped there. The second full video talks about the relationship of the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Pentateuch, and although to a lot of that, especially to the creation story, especially to the creation of Adam. Gilgamesh also has a direct connection to the Leo section of Mark, it points to the Scorpio section, the Scorpio section points right back, and they both point to, to Gilgamesh. Again, pretty sure that's the Holy Spirit at work. That video came up out of my work on the documentary hypothesis, by the way. I know it's complicated. I hope I make it better, but that's the nature of original research. You open the door, the door hits a domino, the domino knocks down a bunch of other dominoes. The Leo section is a very big deal. It includes the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've talked about that on several occasions, and that is fitting because this is a kingly sign. The constellation's principal star is Regulus, which is Latin for the little king or the prince. Le petit prince sticks in my head. Gold is Leo's medal. That's the medal of kings. The sign is ruled by the sun, the only sign that is. Leo is ruled by the sun. That's why I've reused this t-shirt that I used in The Ghost of the Festus Disc is Roused. This is from Minoan Crete, the griffin. It is a sun symbol used by kings. Leo also represents the heart. Different signs of the zodiac represent different body parts. It is a heart that binds our bodies together. It binds the church together. It binds our friends and family together, just as Christ binds us all together and binds us together with the Father. Amen. So, let's jump into our gospel. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So how is this related to Leo? Actually, it's related to the constellation of Hydra, which is a deacon of Leo. Look at all the other constellations associated with it. We have an owl, a raven, a cup, which can hold water. Notice where it's pointing. There's a ship below it. At its head is Cancer, the crab. That was my last video. At its tail is Virgo. That will be my next video. I'm a Virgo. Okay, now read Revelations 12. That chapter probably isn't dealing with future events. It's probably talking about what the stars looked like when Jesus was born. And Hydra is Satan there, too, although he was personified in the body of a king. Notice the cup is pointed to Virgo. And now the big one, the Transfiguration. I've talked in the past about the connection between the Transfiguration and the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I will here as well, just a little bit. But in the past, I thought the relationship between the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Bible in general was adversarial. After all, Gilgamesh is two-thirds God, he's a giant, therefore he's one of the Nephilim, the Mighty Ones, therefore he's a bad guy, etc. I no longer believe that. The Gilgamesh of the Epic is a fictional character. The Gilgamesh, who was king of Uruk in the 3rd millennium BC, was apparently well loved by his people, so he might be in heaven. I'd like to think that he is. The epic as received was written by Amorites, 
And according to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 3, the Israelites are part Amorite. Furthermore, the epic was edited into its recognizable form a thousand years before Babylon was condemned by God. Meanwhile, it had passed from the Amorites to the Kassites to the Chaldeans, that Babylon might as well be over in China. In fact, the epic was organized during the life of the patriarch Jacob. And other than the names of characters and the details of stories that are in the epic, which they got from the Sumerians in the south, this is a completely original creation. So original, in fact, that it's Gilgamesh is a fictional character. And since, as I said, it was written by relatives of the Israelites, it seems the Bible actually approves of the epic. Now, not as scripture, obviously, but certainly as a temporary remedy for the ailment of a fallen world. And in this case, as in most others, the remedy is in your head. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led them up into a high mountain out of the way, alone. And he was transfigured before them, and his raiment did shine, and was made very white, even as snow, such a white as no fuller can make upon the earth. This is the reference to Gilgamesh. He had magic clothes that did not require laundering when he returned from the land of the dead. Jesus, who had just declared war on death and hell, wore clothes so bright that they could not have been laundered even if they needed it. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they talked to Jesus. And Peter spoke and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And yet he did not know what he was saying, for they were afraid. And there was a cloud that covered them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my dear son, hear him. Notice the cloud. Notice we have a declaration from a cloud. Very important. Notice also just three people had been pulled up into the mountain with Jesus. Nobody else. And suddenly, when they looked around about them, they saw no one but Jesus with them. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' face shines like the sun, and his clothing is white as the light. Well, the sun rules Leo, as we talked about earlier. And quite often, as in this case, Matthew is actually more zodiacal than Mark. Now, typically, that's because Matthew is drawing from a longer version of Mark than the one we have now, the one Luke used. Luke also draws from Mark. Uh, that's called Secret Mark, which is too complicated to get into here. Now, alternatively, Secret Mark got broken up. Objectionable parts got buried, and the rest got folded into the Gospel of Matthew. I say this because Mark added all or most of the stuff to his new, the new stuff to his Gospel after Matthew had died. Now, regardless, I don't think it's true in this case. As I say in Jesus' Husband, my video that I link below, the Leo section sets us up for the Scorpio section, where Jesus marries Lazarus, another man. Obviously, that's the objectionable part that they had to bury. And to make that connection, <clears throat> to make that connection, Leo had to bring in Gilgamesh, and that was considered more important than sticking to the horoscope script. Now, on the other hand, Matthew runs away from the gay. It's too complicated to get into here as well and he goes back to the horoscope script. But way over here in the Gospel of Luke, which is pro-gay, by the way, he uses a Q source, a collection of Jesus' sayings, to allude to Zeus and Ganymede, which Jesus Christ himself almost certainly did. One thing that we know is when it comes to Jesus' sayings, they were actually very good at transmitting what he had to say. Now, he alludes to Zeus and Ganymede just exactly like Mark alludes to Gilgamesh. Now, Zeus, of course, is a thunder god, Ganymede is his Phrygian male lover. And in Luke's version of the Transfiguration, Jesus is a thunder god. His clothing is exostrepto. The light breaks out like lightning. Now, I guess you could say the Gospel and the Zodiac is the textbook I use for this series. It was written by the Reverend Bill Darlison. He had a great idea and he followed up on it brilliantly. But there's one little thing he does that really gets on my nerves. It's nothing he does out of malice. He does it because he thinks he's being nice and wise. And in the process, he drops the ball on who Jesus Christ really is, certainly who he is in relation to us. Most of Christendom interprets this to mean that Jesus alone has a oneness with God, a position which undoubtedly hinders all genuine dialogue with non-Christian faiths. But this is not the only possible interpretation. For Gnostics, and for all who accept the perennial philosophy in one or the other of its guises, I am refers to the awareness of identity with God, which can be experienced by all who discover the Christ within. On such an interpretation, the Christ is not a single historical figure, but the eternal principle of mystical unity with the divine, which, says Thomas Hickey, 
has been discovered and proclaimed by saints and sages, poets and wise people throughout history and is recorded in the sacred books, mythologies and literatures of all cultures. Reverend Darlison agrees. Jesus claimed identity with God. It's after that he has problems. In Exodus 33, God grants a request to Moses. He will show him his glory, but you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see there's a place by me where you can stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Then he delivers. The Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and do not let anyone be seen throughout all the mountain and do not let flocks or herds graze in front of that mountain. So again, something to be shown alone, just like we see with the transfiguration. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name, the Lord. Okay, note that he's descended in a cloud. I add at the end, even though it's not in this translation, because it is in the Hebrew, because we move, we move right into, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. So the Lord is standing with him and passing in front of him. The Bible doesn't say he's doing one than the other. It says he's doing both. Why is that? Because Yahweh isn't just another name for El, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why the documentary hypothesis is wrong. It assumes that Yahweh is another God. He's a thunder God. In Middle Eastern imagery, thunder gods were cloud riders. El is a sky father. And thunder gods were coming on strong in the Bronze Age when Moses lived. Everyone had different answers on what the relationship is between these two deities. The Bible's answer is found in Christianity. The thunder god is the sky father, one god, two persons. One standing next to Moses, the other walking past him. The Lord, the Lord, God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, the visiting the iniquity of their parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. It's going to be very important for the transfiguration. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. He said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Does that sound like we're a little sliver of God on earth? Sounds like he's ready to break out and destroy us and we would deserve it. What's going on is Father and Son have both revealed themselves to Moses. The Father glorifies the Son, just as the Son glorifies the Father. And most importantly, he's telling us what his Son is going to do. He's going to break the hold of sin. This is a bookend. The other bookend is the Transfiguration. And they go out of their way to make that connection, albeit with necessary changes. It's God the Father who speaks from the cloud this time. And that cloud is a very important detail. And instead of being visited by Yahweh, Moses visits Yahweh. And he's joined by Elijah, who had championed the storm god Yahweh against his Syrian rival Hadad, who's called Baal. Baal means Lord, just like Adonai means Lord. The Gospel of John does not have a version of the Transfiguration. It's the only one that does not. But it does say in John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory is of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Now, many people think John is alluding to the transfiguration here, and they would be right, because he has drawn the exact same conclusion that I have. The transfiguration was a fulfillment of the promise that God had made Israel on Mount Sinai. Now, remember, Moses sees this vision, or sees this, actually, not a vision, he actually sees it, because God had granted his request to see God's glory, which is exactly the word that, that John uses. Now, as annoyed as I get with Reverend Darlison, and I do get mightily annoyed, especially here in the Leo section, I have to give the man full faith and credit for delivering on his promise. For example, the next passage and his spectacular work on it. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, 
Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down. And he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you're able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, This kind can come out only through prayer. Now, does this have something to do with the Zodiac? Well, I'll be, it does. Matthew's version of this story, Matthew 17, 14 through 21, adds another dimension. According to Matthew, the young man is not harboring a dumb spirit, as Mark says. He is moonstruck, selenia zetai, a term which has perplexed commentators and translators, so much so that the boy's condition is generally considered to be epilepsy, since epileptic seizures were thought to be influenced by the moon. But the Greeks had a perfectly good word for epilepsy, epilepsy. And presumably, Matthew could have used this word if he had wanted to. Also, whether or not he was having fits, he still couldn't speak and he still couldn't hear. Moreover, there is the intriguing possibility that Matthew used this word for a different reason, a reason connected with Leo's principal star, Regulus, which lies directly on the ecliptic, the sun's apparent path in the sky, which means it is occulted, hidden, by the sun every year around August 22nd, and even more frequently by the moon. That's his stress. Regulus is the little king, the prince. After being illumined by the sun, it is struck by the moon, tossed to the earth, buffeted between the fire, or the sun, and the water, the moon. Whereas the sun rules maturity, giving mastery and direction to action. The moon, by contrast, rules infancy, with its changeability in the imperfection and inarticulate state of its soul. That's from Ptolemy. That's a very tight match. Well, that's the end of the Leo video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you found it helpful. Virgo is next. That's my girl. God bless.